In 1978, Superman made the world believe that a man could fly right off the pages of a comic book and into movie theaters, proof that the characters could work for an adult audience when grounded in an adult world. It was a spectacular finish line for a character and genre that had been evolving through media for 40 years, but it would take another 10 years before a different comic book superhero would give us a glimpse of the future and show us what it really meant to be the man of tomorrow. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the History of Batman. Thank you to Monkpack for sponsoring this video. Use code Galaxy Media to get 20% off your first purchase today. Monkpack offers low sugar, keto friendly bars that are plant based, gluten free, and non GMO. They're the perfect snack for anyone who is trying to eat better or cut back on sugar and carbs without sacrificing taste. Monk Pack Keto Granola Bars and Nut and Seed Bars contain 1 gram of sugar or less, 2 to 3 grams of net carbs, and each bar contains 150 calories or less. If you're like me, when you think of peanut butter cocoa chip, you think of candy, cookies, brownies, delicious indulgent snack treats. It was the thing in my lunchbox as a kid that I pushed the bag of carrots out of the way to get to. Beat it, carrots! I'm with peanut butter cocoa chip. Monk Pack Bars come in delicious flavors like sea salt, dark chocolate, coconut cocoa chip, and caramel sea salt. They're perfect for a quick breakfast, a snack between video calls, or as a guilt-free decadent dessert. By shopping online, you can always have your snack drawer stocked and have Monk Pack delivered right to your door. Monk Pack is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll exchange the product or refund your money, whichever you prefer. So get 20% off your first purchase of any Monk Pack product by visiting MonkPack.com and entering our code GALAXYMEDIA at checkout, or just simply click the link in the description below to get 20% off. Thank you again to Monk Pack for sponsoring this video. Batman is a 1989 feature film directed by Tim Burton, starring Jack Nicholson, Michael Keaton, and Kim Basinger. Based on the comic book character created by Bob Kane and Bill Finger in 1939, it is one of the most consequential reboots in the history of comic book media, and that is saying something. Gotham City has become synonymous with crime. The streets are overrun, the public officials are helpless, corruption rules the day, all orchestrated by head thug Carl Grissom. Grissom is a man that Mayor Borg, District Attorney Harvey Dent, and Police Commissioner Gordon swear to bring to justice, while at the same time reports of a mysterious bat-like creature stalking the shadows at night, preying on those very lawbreakers, are increasing. Reporter Alexander Knox and photojournalist Vicki Vale are determined to uncover the truth behind this urban legend, a task made all the more challenging by Vale's increasingly romantic relationship with eccentric billionaire Bruce Wayne. Because Bruce has secrets, and not just those associated with Wayne Enterprises. More importantly, witnessing the murder of his parents when he was a child, motivating him to one day don a black winged suit and wage a one-man crusade against criminals like the Joker as Batman. Batman got his start in 1939 in the pages of Detective Comics. Created by Bob Kane with Bill Finger, Batman was a product of the era. A pulpy, crime-fighting detective at war with crime, and he didn't give no guff if they died in the process. It wasn't long before that hard-boiled creature of the night began to lighten up, especially with the addition of Robin in 1940. After World War II, the stories got even lighter, as decreed by DC Comics directly. By the 1960s, Batman's popularity was beginning to wane, but then he became a big TV star, tying his mainstream image to camp and campiness. Between the 1960s Batman TV series and the various cartoons produced by Hanna-Barbera and Filmation, Batman was seen as, at best, a colorful costumed hero who was a positive role model with a comically serious concern about being a law-abiding citizen, and at worst, a cosplaying babysitter. In 1978, Superman changed the way superheroes were featured in movies by presenting a dramatic story centered on characters and relationships, and choosing not to poke fun at superheroes or comic books at all. Superman's success proved that comic book superheroes can work as the source material for an adult movie-going audience. That fight continued on TV with superheroes like Wonder Woman, Hulk, Spider-Man, and Shazam. Attention quickly turned to Batman on the strength of his prior TV fame. The result was a very brief reunion of Adam West and Burt Ward in the comically camp roles they played a decade before. Meanwhile, Batman was already getting a makeover in the comics. In 1969, writer Denny O'Neill and artist Neil Adams made a conscious effort to take Batman back to his roots, back from the ridiculousness that had defined so much of his history. In 1977, Steve Englehart tried the same thing with a 
bit more deliberate focus. Take Batman back to his roots, yes, but more importantly, establish new guidelines for how Batman should be written. One, make the Batman an adult, not a child's image of an adult. Two, make Bruce Wayne a character, not just an alter ego. Three, give him a sex life with a woman strong enough to be his partner. Four, set the whole thing in a deeply pulp atmosphere. Five, make the Joker actually crazy. Five points that would set a new course for the 1980s and beyond. In October of 1979, movie producers Benjamin Melnicker and Michael Uslan acquired the film rights for Batman from DC Comics. Like Denny O'Neill and Steve Englehart in the comics, Melnicker and Uslan wanted to go back to the core of what Bob Kane and Bill Finger created, a single-minded dark vigilante with fear as his weapon in a war against crime. First, they had to convince a studio that their concept of Batman was viable. Convince them to move on from the Batusi, from Kerpowie, from Batman in space. But the writers and directors they had in mind either weren't available or weren't interested. Uslan, a literal historian of comics, having developed and taught the first ever accredited college course on comics history and cultural relevance, wrote a movie treatment himself called Return of the Batman. Two more producers, John Peters and Peter Gubert, joined the project, and in 1980, as Superman 2 hit theaters, Batman was a officially announced with a budget of $15 million. Warner Brothers, the studio who released both Superman 1 and Superman 2, picked up the Batman project where it then sat for three more years. In 1983, as Superman 3 hit theaters, a new script called The Batman was delivered by Tom Mankiewicz, influenced by characters and concepts introduced by Steve Englehart in 1977. The new script came with an opening date pushed back to 1985, but a higher budget of $20 million. That's when speculation started to really pick up steam. Who would direct Ghostbusters Ivan Reitman? Gremlins Joe Dante? Who would wear the pointy-eared cowl? Harrison Ford? Kevin Bacon? The Luck Dragon from NeverEnding Story? Ghostbusters Bill Murray with perhaps Eddie Murphy as his Robin? Pat Morita? Michael Douglas? No way. Not this time. No. Not this time. After working in Disney animation on films like The Fox and the Hound, Tron and the Black Cauldron, Tim Burton became a name after 1985's Pee-wee's Big Adventure, a film that made $40 million against a budget of only $8 million. It was the film that brought together Burton and singer-songwriter Danny Elfman. Burton was picked to direct, and with that came a new treatment for the film written by Julie Hickson, whom he was dating at the time. The pair wanted to move away from what they felt was still leftover camp in the Tom Mankiewicz version. That was superseded by a version by Steve Englehart, who was brought in to apply his vision from the comics to the existing treatments. In March of 1986, they had a version of the script that utilized several characters from Englehart's run, including Batman's love interest Silver St. Cloud, Robin the Joker, mob boss Rupert Thorne, and the Penguin to be played by three Colin Farrells in a trench coat. Did we confirm? that? The Batman. By May, Englehart had trimmed the cast down, eliminating Robin and Penguin. Then the whole thing was handed off to Sam Hamm, who delivered his version in October of 1986, switching out Silver St. Cloud for the deep-cut Vicky Vale, Rupert Thorne for Carl Grissom, and reducing Robin's appearance to a cameo. But still, the project sat unmade. In 1986, DC Comics published Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns, a genre and character redefining look into the future of the DC universe. One that, in combination with 1986's Punisher limited series from Marvel and 1987's Watchmen and 1988's Batman the Killing Joke from DC Comics, helped cement a new era for superheroes. One of grim and gritty realism, of more mature storytelling and situations, a new dark age of comics. Dark Knight Returns and Killing Joke put Batman in the forefront of the new gritty adult superheroes and slightly older readers. Leadership. While at the same time, Tim Burton made Beetlejuice, starring Michael Keaton with music by Danny Elfman, a movie that made $75 million against a budget of $15 million. Warner Brothers moved to capitalize on all of that. Batman was officially, officially put into production in April of 1988, just one year after Superman 4. Burton brought Elfman with him to do the music and Michael Keaton to play Batman, which briefly tore a hole in the fabric of the fandom. A first look at the world to come. Fans were not happy about the casting of a comic actor who stood five foot nine and was most known for playing Mr. Mom. In fact, they weren't happy about Tim Burton either. Warner Brothers is ruining my childhood, they would have screamed on YouTube. Batman is a very serious business, they would have tweeted. Hashtag not my Batman. Hashtag more like Mr. Beetlejuice's mom man. Tim Burton, more like Tim Burp man. As screenwriter Sam Hamm put it, they hear Tim Burton's name and they think of Pee-wee's Big Adventure. They hear Keaton's name and they think of any number of Michael Keaton comedies. You think of the 1960s version of Batman, and it was the complete opposite of our film. We tried to market it with a typical dark and serious tone, but the fans didn't believe us. It's here, now on video cassette. Batman. 
Call toll-free and we'll send this Batman video to your door for just $19.99 plus shipping and handling. What are you? I'm Batman. cassette for just $19.99. Call now and this Batman pin is yours free. Burton picked Keaton because he thought he could deliver the darkness just below the surface. Fans wanted someone like Mel Gibson, Tom Selleck, Dennis Quaid. Adam West wanted Adam West. Even Warner Brothers would have preferred a more known action star. But there was no putting the lid back on the fan rage. Media questioned Keaton's physique, his fitness for the action that might be required. Fans started writing letters by the thousands to Warner Brothers, begging them to change course before it was too late. Opposite Keaton, actors like Tim Curry, John Lithgow, and Ray Liotta were all possibilities for Joker. Tim Burton was considering John Glover, but Warner Brothers again wanted a known name. Someone like Robin Williams, who was very interested, but definitely Jack Nicholson if possible. Jack Nicholson wasn't really that interested. He didn't say no, but he also didn't say yes. As a backup, Warner Brothers made a deal with Tim Curry that Tim would get paid for the role whether he ended up actually doing it or not. Spoiler alert, he did not. Curry's deal was ultimately the kick in the pants for Nicholson to finally agree to do it. He would take a pay cut to $6 million from his normal $10 million, but he wanted a base payout plus residuals, including related merch, plus top billing. Some estimates suggest that he made upwards of $90 million total. Kim Basinger got the part of Vicki Vale after Sean Young was injured in a horse riding accident. Kim was not only capable of the role, she was available and could commit on short notice. Ricky Addison Reed was cast as Robin, but the character was cut before any scenes were shot. Billy Dee Williams was cast as Harvey Dent to potentially become Two-Face in a sequel, but that wouldn't happen until decades later we'll come back to this. Burton's Batman went to places that ran counter to what he had been perceived as for decades on television. Gotham, the city itself, was designed to be a character. Anton First, production designer, said their intent was to make Gotham City the ugliest and bleakest metropolis imaginable. I'm trying to imagine a city where uh, there had been no planning permission for 300 years. So Tim's description of the city was that uh, it was like hell had erupted through the pavements and carried on growing. And that becomes Gotham City. All of Batman's stuff was updated not only for a fresh modern take, but to feel as though they could exist in that aforementioned hell on Earth. The Batmobile was inspired by jet aircraft mixed with race cars of the 1930s. And bats, of course. The suit evolved out of designs pulled directly from the comics with new lines, new aesthetics that would find the light on screen. Over two dozen designs were sculpted with as many different versions of the cape. By the time they finalized the design, they had spent nearly a quarter of a million dollars. That all-black suit was a powerful visual statement that this wasn't your father's Batman, capped off by a new bat symbol, retaining the yellow oval, a bright object to draw gunfire away from Batman's head, but with a newly shaped bat, one with little feet. This was done because apparently a lot of people can't see the black bat on the symbol. Whatever optical trick of the brain occurs when they look at it, it's the negative space created by the bat shape that they perceive as an open yellow mouth with big round teeth. As if Batman would put a jack-o'-lantern symbol on his chest. The little feet were added in an attempt to make it look less like a mouth and more like a bat. With little feet. With little feet. <laughs> Batman was filmed at Pinewood Studios in England from October of 1988 to February of 1989. The budget that began at $30 million ended up closer to $48 million. With the heightened attention, the enormous fan anticipation, and constant media coverage, Tim Burton called it the worst period of his life. After having worked with Burton on Beetlejuice and Pee Wee's Big Adventure, lead singer and songwriter of Oingo Boingo, Danny Elfman composed the score. A second soundtrack featuring the smash hit Bat Dance was a full album composed and performed by Prince, a rare occurrence where a film had two different musical releases. Batman was a tonal reboot, a performance reboot, a suit reboot, but most importantly it was a marketing reboot. The way a summer blockbuster, the way a comic book superhero was promoted ahead of time, the urgency to build anticipation and crush theaters on opening day was a deliberate, calculated goal. Things reached a boiling point leading up to the opening. On the strength of the trailers and commercials alone, Batman was already bleeding into every marketable corner of pop culture, of consumable goods. Batmania drove the sales of nearly a billion dollars worth of clothes, toys, comics, games, and cereal. 
DC produced a comic book adaptation based on the screenplay, which features a few differences from the film. Nintendo released a side-scrolling game that is very difficult, and some people still haven't been able to defeat the Joker. Anything you could put movie Batman or comic book Batman on was licensed. Posters, pins, buttons, makeup kits, costumes, window cleans, books, keychains, shirts, hats, shirts, trading cards, PVC figures, shirts, diecast cars, watches, bed sheets, model kits, candy, shirts, and more shirts. Toy Biz released a line of action figures and vehicles, a Bat Cave, the Batmobile with plastic shields, Batwing, Bat Cycle, Joker Van. Figure designs were influenced by Kenner's Superpowers line from just a few years before. Batman and Joker were based more on ideas of Batman and Joker rather than likenesses of Keaton and Nicholson. I can tell you that at the time, I was a kid psyched to have figures from the movie and could not have cared less that it didn't look like the actual actors. Bob the Goon, though, nailed it. Preview screenings for Batman started on Monday, June 19th, 1989, and accounted for over $2 million in ticket sales. That momentum continued into the weekend as it officially opened Friday, June 23rd, around the U.S., raking in over $40 million. Breaking opening weekend records briefly held by Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade and Ghostbusters 2 from May and June of the same year. Finally, finally, Batman the movie is here. This is the film they have been waiting for. And tonight's special showing at the Americana at 10 o'clock was a sellout. <laughs> The truth for Batman. Are all those people waiting now? You're kidding. You see, Batman and a lot of these folks go way back. But this is an old shirt. It's not one of the new ones. We got this years ago, so we're old Batman fans. It's Batmania this summer. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone wants to see this movie. My life is really <laughs> complex. And Warner Brothers is banking on the fact that the movie will only whet the appetites of real bataholics. They've come out with mugs and a whole catalog of Batman memorabilia. In fact, there is even a 1-800-BATMAN number in here to get your merchandise to you faster. Yes, folks love Batman, and I'll tell you, already people are lining up to buy tickets to the special 1220 showing of Batman this morning at the Americana. There are eight showings daily, as you can see here at the Americana, so I guess uh, Bat fans don't have have to settle for the same bat time or even the same bat theater starting tomorrow. Reporting live from the Americana in Southfield, Teresa Lucanis, TV2 Eyewitness News. Batmania pushed sales into the second week with another $30 million, and Batman officially became the fastest film to reach $100 million, doing it in just 11 days. The initial run in theaters ended December 14th with a total of over $411 million worldwide. Fans were able to bring the experience home on VHS less than six months later, which was unheard of at the time. It set a precedent for releasing the home version the same calendar year the film was released, cutting off the bootleg market before it could even get going and adding another $150 million in sales. Despite the historic box office numbers, some fans had concerns with the liberties taken by the writing team, playing fast and loose with long-established canon, the Joker now being responsible for the death of Thomas and Martha Wayne instead of the esteemed Joe Chill. Alfred just letting Vicki Vale waltz right into the Batcave instead of somersaulting into it or guessing a password. Screenwriter Sam Hamm chalked it up to the writer strike in 1988 where changes were made by other writers and Tim Burton himself without consulting Hamm. He thought the script was done. Perfect? No, but he never would have put those changes through in his name. Batman was dark, yes, but was it dark enough? Fans continue to this day to question the casting of Michael Keaton, but the industry felt differently, mainly because of the money it made. Heck, Batman was the first comic book movie to win a competitive Oscar, in this case, for Best Art Direction. Batman's success launched a franchise which resulted in three more films in 92, 95, and 97. It also got Warner Brothers to greenlight Batman the Animated Series, which carried on the more mature storytelling, the more realistic presentation, and the theme song, subsequently launching an entire animated universe itself. Inspired by the success of Batman in 1989 and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles in 1990, other comic book and comic strip heroes found their way to theaters. Dick Tracy in 1990, The Rocketeer in 91, The Shadow, The Mask, and The Crow in 1994, Judge Dredd and Tank Girl in 1995, the Phantom in 1996, a golden age of comic-inspired films that would last until the Blade franchise premiered in 1998. After the poor performance of Batman and Robin in 1997, to date the only movie I have ever walked out of, the Bat franchise was put on ice. Returning in 2005 with Batman Begins, a darker, grittier, more mature, more realistic interpretation of the character that takes him back to his roots as a pulpy one-man warrior in the fight against crime. Then why was it me who was the only one who lost everything? You were supposed to be the best of all of Gotham. You were supposed to be the symbol of good. 
That series was followed by a Batman portrayed by Ben Affleck, who never got his own series, rather a shared billing with Henry Cavill's Superman in 2016's Batman vs. Superman, followed by the ensemble cast of Justice League in 2017. Each reboot, each new version of Batman, each year that passed, ripening the nostalgia for the Batman that kicked it all off. There have been action figures, statues, and other licensed merchandise based on the 1989 version of Batman from toy companies like NECA, Hot Toys, and Mattel. But more significantly, in 2021, DC Comics published Batman 89, a continuation of Tim Burton's Batman series picking up after the events of Batman Returns in 1992. Batman 89 brings back Keaton's Batman, Michael Goff's Alfred, Michelle Pfeiffer's Catwoman, and introduces a new Robin inspired by Marlon Wayans, who was at one point in the running to play Robin in the movies. More importantly, it sees the return of Billy Dee Williams, Harvey Dent, and finally delivered delivers on the 33-year-old tease of his transformation into the villainous alter ego Two-Face. Written by original Batman screenwriter Sam Hamm with art by Joe Quinones, it was part of a one-two punch with Superman 79 that continued the world of the Richard Donner Superman movies from the late 70s and 80s. The question for Batman 89 is, is it Batcanon? Yes, kind of. According to 2019's Crisis on Infinite Earths television event on the CW, Earth-89 is the universe of the Burton Bat films, including Batman and Batman Returns, but not Batman Forever or Batman and Robin. Sam Hamm has stated that this is where the Batman 89 comic takes place. Comic book superheroes have become the dominant genre in movie theaters, and very recently there's been a push toward alternate universes and the mixing of timelines that has seen the return of characters and actors who have previously been cycled out over over time and franchise reboots, returning to their roles alongside the current iteration of those characters. Someone once told me time is a flat circle. If everything we've ever done or will do, we're gonna do over and over and over again. We are in a phase of consumerism where the franchises begin to lap themselves, where the studios attempt to please all the fans all the time, narratives be damned, in a warped desire for everything to be connected so nothing ever expires, where reality folds in on itself as the passage of time, or the perception thereof, collapses into a singularity, allowing every version of every franchise to be elevated to priority status and consumed simultaneously. Whether it's Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield reprising their roles as Spider-Man with Tom Holland in No Way Home, or John Wesley's ship running alongside Grant Gustin's Flash, once unleashed, it was inevitable that this phenomenon would eventually come to Batman. As of this video, Michael Keaton's Batman is already planned to be featured in the Flash movie due out, uh, in the future. Keaton Batman may also appear in the Batgirl movie on HBO Max, which doesn't have a release date yet, likely won't come out until after The Flash. Batman's impact at the box office was more than just ticket sales. While there were a lot of ticket sales, there have been a lot of movies that made a lot of money that didn't establish a new model for how films would be developed and marketed decades into the future. As Scott Mendelson wrote in a 2019 Forbes article about Batman's legacy on the 30th anniversary of its release, Batman showed Hollywood that they could make a film, a non-sequel film no less, that could be a presumed guaranteed moneymaker by virtue of its source material. Scott continues, The other trend that Batman began was the notion of a kid-targeted property being fashioned into a movie aimed at older moviegoers. The notion of a Batman movie that wasn't for kids, filled with adult movie stars like Jack Nicholson, Michael Keaton, and Kim Basinger, became a template for the current Hollywood tentpole. Scott also wrote in 2009 that the foundation for the movie landscape we live in today was laid by Batman because, one, it made the opening week and box office the most important metric for what would be considered success or failure. Two, the drastic shortening of the turnaround time for home video where the film itself acts as a commercial for the home version. Three, casting against type with respect to regular looking dudes being able to take on action hero status. Four, PG-13 is a must. Five, pre-existing properties are safe because they are pre-sold. They can be sequeled and rebooted to infinity. Batman was a huge success at the box office and with the fans. Both Keaton and and Nicholson were praised for their performances, and it became the fifth highest grossing film of all time at the time. The production design from Gotham City to the Batmobile to Batman's suit turned the mainstream perception of Batman around 180 degrees, and with it all of comic books and superheroes. He was no longer a dancing punchline, he was the template for modern adult superhero entertainment. Very serious business. Batman's reinvention was the model for nearly every comic book property that followed well into the late 90s with Blade and the 2000s with X-Men. From Transformers to the Avengers to the Batman movie, the Batman that came out this year, every film is targeting the same audience with the same plan, hoping for the same results. They say dress for the job you want. These days, everyone wants to be Batman. I am Batman.
Thanks for watching. Please hit like, hit subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. Thank you very much to those of you who already are. Check us out on Twitch at twitch.tv slash toygalaxy if you're in the position to help the channel grow. If you would like early access to the videos ad-free, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash toygalaxy. Special thanks to Scott Mendelson for all of his movie criticism work. If you have a chance, go read all of his stuff. My paraphrasing here doesn't do it justice. Let us know in the comments down below if you have a story from Batman's run in theaters back in 89. I saw it on opening night. It was the hottest ticket in town. I had to go back and see it again. If for no other reason than we sat in the very front row, four feet from the screen, against the wall. Not the ideal viewing angle, currently not. Certainly not what Tim Burton intended. It was all thighs and crotch from here. Cut. Right up at his crotch. <laughs>